fill in for him, so I have a brief lesson, and I would like to dive into it. Now, the scripture for this morning is 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read from verses 3 through 7. Scripture reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which is effective in the patient enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. Now, to give you an idea of what's going on and what necessitated this letter, Paul is in Macedonia, most likely the city of Philippi. He is waiting for Titus. And as you remember, in the first letter to the Corinthians, a lot of correction had to be made. Paul had to come down pretty hard on them for the things that they were allowing to happen, not correcting. And so he is anxious to find out the result of, of all that correction and, that, and the result of that letter. So he's waiting for Titus. Titus comes to him. Titus gives him a favorable report. And now Paul is elated. Paul is joyful over what he hears. But Titus allows him a, a minute or two to, 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 to enjoy, and then he begins to let him know that there is a problem brewing in the church. And what has happened is there are false teachers, false apostles that want to discredit Paul. And they feel as if they can discredit Paul, that they can now move in to the church and introduce their doctrine. So Paul has to now make a defense against these very individuals, does not want to, but you see, this is not the only church that Paul is watching over. So if he allows this to go and does not present a defense, then the other churches will hear of it and then he's going to have a bigger problem on his hands. So he doesn't want to defend himself, but he knows that he has to. To, to, and, and validate his um, authority as apostles. So everything that he has told them is, in, is the will of God. And Paul, later on in 2 Corinthians 12, around verse 13, identifies these very apostles, or so-called apostles. He says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, who, whose end shall be according to their works. So now we know what necessitated this letter. So, for my lesson, the title will be When Suffering Comes. I'm going to deal with the right mindset that we have when suffering comes. I'm going to deal with the purpose of suffering, and I'm going to deal with the power of prayer in suffering. So let's go to verse number 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So the first thing, that word blessed, elohitos in the Greek, in its definition, the notes that it, in the New Testament, it's just, it, it refers to God, and, it, and it, in it, it says that he is praiseworthy, worthy of praise. So the first thing when you encounter suffering, when you encounter affliction, trials, tribulation, is to remember to praise God. Now, let's get an idea of what that praise looks like. Let's go to Psalms 103, beginning at verse number 1. In Psalms 103, beginning at verse number 1, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. That is, with, with all that is within you is with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Praise God. Okay? What that praise is going to do is, because we have, when suffering comes, when trials come, we tend to fixate on the problem. But from, from the text, it tells us, praise God with all that you have. What's that going to do? It's going to get your mind right. It's going to take the focus off the problem and put it on God. And it's going to remind you of all the things he's done, what he has promised, and what he will do. 
the next verse, in verse number two, he says, bless the, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Remember everything that he has done. Remember everything that he has promised in his word for you that he will do for you in these difficult times. And it says in verse number three, who pardons all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems us from the life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. So you see, when you praise God with all that you have, then all, it reminds you of all the things that he has done, all the things that he has promised, and in the process of praising, the way the text says to praise, your spirits are going to be lifted, your mind is going to be right, and you are not, no, no one is going to be able to steal your, the situation is not going to be able to steal your joy or the peace that you have in Christ Jesus. All right? Now look at the outlook that Paul had in regards to suffering and in regards to affliction. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 10, 10, it says, Therefore I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, I am strong. Okay? He says, I am well content. These are the things that we don't really want any part of. But he's saying, I have learned from, from, what, from God delivering me, from God strengthening me, from God comforting me, how to be content in these adverse situations. He sees it as an opportunity to God, for God to release his strength on his behalf. That's why he can say, I'm well content. Now, oftentimes when suffering comes, we want to be relieved of that suffering. We want to get out of it as soon as possible. And I would be, I would be negligent if I didn't say that sometimes God does not take you and deliver you out of that uh, trial, that tribulation, all right? All you have to do now is look at Jesus, all right? Three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane Jesus asked for another way. And each time he ended the prayer, not my will, but thine be done. And what does the Father do? Does he take him and give him another path? No. He answers his prayer, but he gives him an angel to strengthen him so that he can take the path that's ahead, all right? Another example would be Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he has a thorn in the side. He's been caught up to the third heaven. He has seen things no man has seen, heard things no man has heard. And now he has come back and God has given him a thorn in the side so that he will not be, so pride would not be a, a problem to him. Pride would not be a stumbling block to him. So he's given this thorn, and three times he's asked for this thing to be removed, and, and, and God says, my grace is sufficient, okay? I'm not going to remove this. This thing has come to you for a purpose. I am going to give you what you need, the strength and the comfort you need to endure. Now, I know we don't like to endure in suffering, but sometimes it's his will that we have to endure and, 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 and persevere through certain trials and certain tribulations, all right? So now I'm gonna deal with the purpose of suffering. Now in verse number four it says, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That word affliction is philippus in the Greek, and it is a pressing, a pressure, okay? It would be anything that would cause you to be, if we were making it applicable today, anything that would cause stress, that would cause sleepless nights, that would cause you to be weighed down by worry, by anxiety, anything that would be able to steal your joy, to steal the peace that you have in Christ Jesus. So why does God allow these things? All right, it would be a beautiful thing if all we had to do was open the Bible, read what we have to do, and then do it. It would be a beautiful thing, but it doesn't work that way. Sometimes what we will do is we will read, 
we will see what God has commanded us to do, we will look at our own strength, and we will make a determination. Well, I can't do that, so I'm not even going to try to do that. I'll do this, God, and, and give me a pass on that. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. And only through the process of trials and tribulations and being put in these difficult situations can we then make that transformation, you know, from, from not trusting to trusting, from being independent to being dependent. So let's look at verse number 8. It says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our afflictions, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had sent the, the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So Paul, let's go back, let's do a little history of Paul when he was Saul, when he was a Pharisee, you know, studying under the feet of Gamaliel. Most people believe that he was going to be the next high priest. He knew the law inside and out. He had a passion. He looked at anything that was not in harmony with the law at, to be eradicated. He looked at Christianity as something that had to be eliminated because it was not in harmony with the law. So Paul was an independent person. Paul was taking care of business. And now, if it wasn't for Jesus stopping him on the Damascus Road, Damascus Road, then he would have continued down that path. But Jesus, when he called him on the Damascus Road and he told him what to do to be saved and he entered into the body, he had to learn the process of how to go from being independent to dependent on God. And, and, and oftentimes when we come into the church, we bring certain habits certain traits with us that are not in harmony with the will of God and oftentimes what has to happen is we have to go through these various trials, these various tribulations in order to let go of those things. All right. So Paul has gotten into these situations where he is learning how to be, go from being independent to dependent on God. Now look at it. In verse 8 again, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our afflictions which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. So he's saying that he's got into some situations where he saw the only way out was death. He saw him going home to glory. That's the only way I see getting out of this. Okay. Now in verse 9, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we, what was the purpose of him going through all these things? So that we would not trust in ourselves. You see, the process of going from independent to dependent on God. All right, so, and then in verse 10 he says, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope and he will yet deliver us. So he, you see the process, all right? Learning how to trust in God, rely on God, on God, and be dependent on God. All right, let's let's deal with another scripture that supports this. Let's go to First Peter one and the verses number six, and it says, "In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith." being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So in this text, it uses gold. You know, gold in its raw state is not what, whoever's doing the process, it's not the desired state. So it has to, immense heat has to be applied to gold in order for the, uh, Contam uh, contaminants to come to the top and be removed. So after continued process of this, uh, of this happening, you get the goal to become what you desire of it. And so if you take that, 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 that thought and you look at us going through trials, when, when, when trials and tribulations come, it is a, a heat 
Look at it as heat, that's the heat being turned up. And in that, when that heat is turned up, what happens is the imperfections in our faith are revealed. And, and, and going through this process causes us to become stronger, causes us to become more dependent on God. But if we didn't have these things, then our faith wouldn't get stronger, our faith wouldn't be tested out, our faith wouldn't be improved. You know, so, so it is necessary for these trials, these tribulations to happen so that we can become stronger, so our faith can be tested out, so our faith can become perfected. All right? I always uh, found James 1 verses 2 through 4 as, as, as hard to understand. In, in James 1, you know, when it says, Consider it all joy. My brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Nothing. Again, verse 2, consider it all joy. How can I consider suffering, trials, and tribulation joy? Because the way you can look at it as a, as a joyful event is, is it's an opportunity for you to see the power of God. It's an opportunity for you to, 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 to see the comfort of God, to, to have your spirit uplifted, strengthened, and, and be delivered from whatever trial, whatever tribulation, whatever affliction that you're going through. Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians 1 and the verses number 4. And basically, comfort those who are in affliction. Okay, in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse number 4, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, to, to break this text down, I just want to share a story with you. All right? And it's a story about one of Nixon's, President Nixon's uh, right-hand men by the name of Paul Colston. And what Paul Colston was, he was a lawyer. And whenever Nixon needed something done, and he didn't care if it was done legally or illegally, Paul Colston was the man that he called, okay? This man had a bag of tricks that he would use to get what he needed to get, all right? So now, Watergate has been exposed, he goes to trial, he's sentenced to, to jail, seven months, he spent seven months in jail. And during that process, he had to go through some suffering, he had to go through some trials and some tribulations. When this man gets out, he, he begins to devote his life to, go, to going back to prison and helping those that are in prison that dealt with the same thing that he dealt with. He becomes an evangelist. He preaches the gospel in jail. He's helping those that are in. He's helping their families that are, that, that are on the outside. He, grow, he, he attains one of the uh, biggest ministries, prison ministries, in the country. So here's a man who, who suffered, who was comforted, who came out and then devoted his life to help others. Okay? So that's the essence of the text. Another reason for suffering is, a, is for us to be an example for others. When we go through our trials and our tribulations and, and we are comforted, we have to share that comfort with others. And sometimes that suffering is not just for you, the individual, it, it will be a benefit for someone else. Okay, and, and what I'm directing it at basically is, is for the younger people in the church. You know, you can give them book, chapter, and verse on how they're, they're to handle their lives, how they're to handle specific situations. But when you get into that, 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 that storm and you start to begin to murmur and complain, you become uh, your words and, and all the information that you've given to them pretty much hold no weight because when you are in the midst of your trial, the midst of your tribulation, you don't, you, you begin to murmur and you begin to, 
complain. So now you become, you, you weaken their faith because what you've told them, when it comes, when, when you're in the middle of it, you're not in harmony with what you're teaching. So keep that in mind, you know. You want to be that person who goes through the storm and you maintain that joy. You maintain that peace that God gives to you. You keep your head up. No one knows what's going on unless you actually tell them. And now you become a testimony to the very people that you have, to, uh, that you've been trying to mentor, that you're teaching, that you're giving the word to. So keep that in mind. I want to share one, one more story with you, and that's a minister and, and his secretary. And the, and the minister asked the secretary, he said, why are you so, have, have a positive outlook and, and, and always uplifted no matter what you're going through? Well, she says, she says to him, well, if, if, you, if you read your Bible, you, you would have the same outlook that I have. And then he says, I read my, my Bible. She said, well, you don't, even, you don't read it right, you know, because she, she says, I remember Paul saying glory in tribulation and glory does not mean growl or complain. Yeah. And only in, in trials and tribulation can you see the strengthening of God and discover the strengthening of God. And, and remember, God is not going to allow you to go through anything that is beyond what you can bear. As long as you utilize the blessings that he provides for you. Now the last point, and it's a brief point, is the power of prayer in suffering. Now in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 1, it says, You also joining in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given to many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed upon us through the prayers of many. Now I notice sometimes that there's a tendency for us that when we're going through trials, when we're going through through tribulations that we don't want to share that with the body. Some of us are not comfortable with sharing that with the body. But I want you to know that there is power when you share what you're going through with the body and ask them to pray on your behalf. You know? And if you're not comfortable coming before the church and, and asking for prayers, then have at least a few brothers and sisters that you can call and ask them to pray for you. For, for the text tells us that there is power in that. You know, let me read it one more time. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us in answer to many prayers. So we, we can't let that, that source of power, that source of blessing, which is having the saints pray for us, go to the wayside. So I, I implore you to utilize that blessing, and, 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 and if, if you're not comfortable coming before the church, have a few brothers and sisters that you can call, let them know what's going on, and ask them to pray with you. And, and then when you get that request, pray earnestly, pray continually for, for, for whatever the, the request is that, that's been made known to you. Now keep this in mind. The Christian community ought to respond to stress and pressure to difficulties and trials and disasters. God has sent them, God has allowed them to come as opportunities that you might learn again this amazing secret of inner strength, inner comfort, inner peace that can keep your heart quiet even though you are going through troubled times. That's my lesson for you. If there's one who wants to put on Christ in the baptism, you come by hearing the word, believing the word, repenting of your sins, confessing the sweetest name known to man, and being baptized in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of sins. Now we come to the portion of our worship service, which is our communion, time of remembrance, taking our minds back to the cross to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, beginning in verse number 7, we are commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. In 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, began 23rd verse, the Bible says, For I have received of the Lord, that which also delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same that was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do, remembrance of me. 
after the same master of the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is new testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, members of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. At this time, let's go to Heavenly Father and pray on behalf of the bread. Our dear kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, Lord, as you to bless us, Lord, take part of this bread. Ever since the Son's broken body. Hope, Lord, we take it in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Now let's pray for the cup. Out of kind words for Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us, Lord, take part of this fruit of the vine, ever since the Son shed its blood. Hope, Lord, we take it with clean hands and pure heart. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. That now concludes the Lord's Supper. We now come to the portion of our worship service, which is the collecting of contributions. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, began the first verse, Now concerning collection for the saints, is that I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. As God has prospered you, that there be no gatherings when I come. You have multiple opportunities to give at this time. We have our text to give. We have our secure lockbox located on the outside of the church building where you can actually come and drop your collection off. And if you want to, you can actually mail your contribution in. Our address, 1709 Staley Avenue, Savannah, Georgia, 31404, 31405. So, as you see, you have multiple opportunities to give. So at this time, let us go to Heavenly Father in prayer on behalf of all those who have given. Our kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come before at this time, Lord, as you continue to bless all those who gave. Heavenly Father, we ask you to continue to bless all those, Lord, who desire to give, Lord, but unfortunately weren't able to at this particular time. We hope we continue to use your, this money, Heavenly Father, for the up and your kingdom here on earth. In our Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Now we come to the portion of our worship service, which we actually go and we actually pray for all those who are on our prayer list. As I said in the welcome this morning, let's remember all those individuals on our prayer list. Sister Legina Stevens, Sister Gwen Bryant, Sister Gwen Miles. All those individuals who have been constantly on our sick and shut-in list, Brother Irvin Thomas, Sister Katrina Hall, continue to pray for Brother Mark Cuthbert as well. So at this time, let's go to Heavenly Father and pray for half of all of these individuals on our sick and shut-in list. Our dear kind, merciful Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we come before you this time just thanking you. Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, for everything that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this, your continued wonderful blessings that are bestowed upon us all, as Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless all those, Lord, who are sick, Lord, and shut in, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, whatever they stand in need of, Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless them, Heavenly Father. Just put your loving hands of grace and mercy around them. Bless them, Lord, that they'll be able to get off the sick bed, Heavenly Father, and to continue to do those things, pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Heavenly Father, continue to bless all those, Lord, who are providing uh, needs and help for those individuals who are sick, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, continue to bless all of those individuals, Heavenly Father, that you provide them the strength, Heavenly Father, that you, you can provide, Heavenly Father, through these particular difficult times. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless all those, Lord, who are going through bereavement at this time. Whatever they stand in need of, Heavenly Father, we ask you to intercede in their lives, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless those families, Heavenly Father. Intercede, Heavenly Father. Bless those families to understand, Heavenly Father, that things happen on your time, Heavenly Father, and for you, and for, and for your reasons, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless them, Heavenly Father, that they will make it through these difficult times. Provide them, Lord, to suffer a source of comfort and peace, Heavenly Father, that only you can provide. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless all those, Lord, who may be traveling. We ask that you give them traveling grace, Heavenly Father, that they will reach their destination, Lord, safely, Lord, without any hurt, harm, or danger, return to us one and the same. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, that you continue to bless, Lord, all of us, Lord, here at this congregation as a whole, Heavenly Father. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to grow together, Lord, in love and unity, Heavenly Father, doing those things, pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the man of God, Lord, Brother Regan, on his message on this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for blessing him to impart on that uh, message on to us, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless him, Lord, and his family, Heavenly Father, and provide him a source of comfort and strength, Heavenly Father, and the wisdom and knowledge of your holy and divine word, Heavenly Father, that he continue to do those things, Heavenly Father, pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you continue to bless, Lord, the leaders of this country, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we're going through a difficult time, Heavenly Father, as a nation, Heavenly Father. But Heavenly Father, we have a just God to lean upon. And Heavenly Father, just ask you to just intercede, Heavenly Father, and let the leaders know, Heavenly Father, that they, they need to do those things, Heavenly Father, for the people, Heavenly Father, and not for any type of uh, particular interest of their own. 
Heavenly Father, continue to bless all of our military and harm's way, Lord, across this nation and across this world as a whole. Heavenly Father, just continue to be with us, Lord, guide us, Lord, bless us and protect us through all the many endeavors that we go through in our daily walk with Thee. It is in Jesus' precious name we do pray. Let us all together say, Amen.